You're listening to Things You Should Know, and I'm your host, Andy Ngo. In this episode, I speak with Professor Clay Rutledge, a quantitative psychologist at North Dakota State University, about the psychology of social justice and religion. I also had a bit of fun by taking the opportunity to ask the professor about his views on sex differences and psychometrics. Dr. Rutledge studies the motives for meaning and belonging in life and just released his new book, Supernatural, Death, Meaning, and the Power of the Invisible World, published by Oxford University Press. You know, I came up in a field of social psychology that has a lot to say, I think, about the topics that people involved in social justice care about. Right, so there's a history in social psychology of research on prejudice and discrimination, and and there's um, a lot of research on group psychology, on you know what people often now call tribalism, um, and psychology they used to just call intergroup relations or group psychology. So there, you know, there's a there's a rich history of research in in my field on these topics, um, and one of the things that struck me when I started to see a lot of the social justice activism was, um, regardless of how well intended it uh, it often is, um, how out of whack it it often is with with what we know from empirical psychology about how to not just improve intergroup relations, but how to actually solve problems related to, 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 to prejudice and bigotry. What do they get most wrong? So I think one of the biggest things, one of the biggest trends that's happening right now that seems to be demonstrably wrong is, you know, often referred to as identity politics. But it's this, it's this notion, you know, I guess it's grounded somewhat in this intersectionality approach, but it's this notion of um, focusing on identities all the time and thinking about our, our group identities and how and distinguishing people based on identities. Um, so one of the problems with that we know from psychology is when you fixate people's um, thought processes on group identities, they start acting like groups. Right? They start acting like members of groups instead of, mem- instead of individuals. And it turns out when you start thinking like members of groups, you have a natural inherent favoritism towards your own group. It's a phenomenon referred to as in-group bias. Even this, even really, really silly group designations can do this. So there's some old experiments that um, done in the UK where they took people and they just told them that you know well, well one one example is they um, they had like a it was like I think a jar of marbles and then you're just asked how many marbles take a guess right how many marbles are in there the, the, that task doesn't have anything to do really with the experiment. But what they're doing is they're, they're creating a basis to form groups in your mind. And so then what they tell you is you're an underestimator or you're an overestimator. You underestimated the number of marbles or you overestimated it, right? That's just a silly group designation, right? There's no, nothing important about that group. But then you do other tasks where you're making, you're giving out, um, you're allocating resources or points and like a, you know, like you would in a game or something. And... All you know about the other people you're allocating points to is whether or not they're underestimators and over us or overestimators. So you just know what group they're in. And it turns out people have a tendency to show favoritism towards the, their own group. The reason they did this experiment this way, it's called the minimal groups paradigm. And the idea is there's a lot of groups historically that have real rich histories of conflict. And so you could imagine saying, um, I show favoritism towards my own religious group, and and it might not be anything that's just fundamental nature of groups in the mind. It might be it's because you have this long history of this is my group, this is what we've been through. So if you can create conditions in which the group membership is so trivial or minimal, um, and you can still show evidence of prejudice, it suggests that this is just something that you naturally do regardless of what the actual group is right so when you think about that's just one example but there's a whole bunch of other research that basically makes this point that when you pe- when you make people think of themselves as members of groups they act 
like groups, right? They favor their group. Um, and a related phenomenon is this idea of, um, you've probably heard of some of this, have you heard of this, um, this um, victimhood culture? Yes. You know, this victimhood culture phenomenon? Um, so you know one of one of the things that they that there's been some research on is this concept called competitive victimhood. So if you're point if it's pointed out to you that your group that you're a part of, um, say males for instance, um, has discriminated against some other group in some meaningful way, like females, um, a, a common response to that is what's referred to as competitive victimhood, which is then you start to think about ways in which that group has discriminated against your group, right? So if you start getting people thinking like this, um, they act like you know they act like groups that are competing um, for diff- competing for resources, right? Or in the victimhood culture, I guess, comp- competing for victimhood status. So it doesn't seem to be a good way to resolve real issues of social justice. And what the research has found that tends seems to work is when you fixate people on a common humanity or what's often called a superordinate group. So if we say it's not, um, I'm not white, you're not black, that's not the, I mean those things might be true, but those aren't, those aren't how we distinguish ourselves. We're both Americans or we're both humans or we're both students at this university or whatever. So if you can find a higher order group that all members are part of as a collective, um, it makes it easier for them to treat each other well and like and see not see each other in competition but see each other cooperatively you know that that seems intuitive but i i see that when when people try to point that out then what some of the um j- race justice activists mm-hmm. um will point out is that well by not wanting to talk about racism systemic racism and oppression you're you're just keeping the status quo yeah yeah, so I've, I've, I've heard that argument as well. And, you know, it's not, the, the reason these arguments are tough is because it's often the case that there's kernels of truth in a lot of positions, right? So it's not the case that I, I totally disagree with that. Um, what the issue becomes, I think, is how, what's the best strategy of how to na- navigate that? And if you look at the history of civil rights, for instance, it wasn't that they were saying, um, uh, the, the more successful campaigns, um, it wasn't that they were ignoring um, systematic oppression for the sake of you know not having conflict with anyone. It was they were saying that I we are part of the same group that you are of human. We have we deserve the same rights and the same opportunity for the American dream that you do. All right, it, it, and that seems to be. Um, a more successful strategy because it's saying we're your allies. Like we want to be, we want what you have. We just want to be treated um, like like equals. And you know, so it's. I I think it's the case that you can you can do this. And I think some social, you know, we're we can talk about the campus social. We can talk about the worst cases of social justice activism. But I, you know, there are also are we often hear about it less. But there clearly are campaigns you could call social justice or whatever you want to call it. There clearly are campaigns to combat um, real issues of discrimination in communities um, that take more of that approach that, you know, we want to be seen as human beings. Um, What's happening, it seems like, in these identity politics that we often see on campus is um, it's not we're we're human beings and we deserve the same, um, we deserve the same treatment. Um, It's we're, we're all different. We're all different in some ways, and you can't. Um, this is a so one of the things that I'm, I'm sure you've seen is you know some of these you know some of these weird campaigns on campus to be like, or like the Evergreen thing, right? So a day without was it a day without white people? A day or, of absence. Yeah. Asking. So this, but you know that that's sort of saying that um, we're different, right? That's sort of distinct. That's a distinguishing uh, tactic, right? That you guys need to go away so we can have our space instead of saying we want. Whatever the grievance is, is we want um, we want to be have the same access and rights as you. And I think on campuses, I mean, there obviously are instances of real racism because you can't control every human being in the world, right? People are gonna there's gonna be racist, right? There's gonna be people that are um, that are not very nice. There's gonna be people that aren't really motivated by race or ideology or anything. They're just um, they're just narcissistic or they're just cruel or whatever. 
I mean, you, you know, you can't really control that, but there's not, there's not a lot of, I mean, I would, I think it would be, it would be difficult to make the, make a compelling argument that there's a, there's a lot of um, systemic racism on college campuses. And so I do think it's interesting that, um, that a lot of these identity politics can, are often are the least, um, you know, like I said, they're the least empirically based or the, you know, the, they're the least likely to be of the type that will be successful seem to happen in the places where they're the least needed, if that makes sense. You do. You've done research in psychology of religion. Now, there have been some some thinkers and writers who have put forth the idea that um, uh, social justice intersectionality, in some way, is like a religion. Um, from what you know, do, do you find that like a is that a fair argument? Yeah. So I would I will use the term quasi religion, or um, and the reason is is because I. Th- you know, there's this idea in psychology called concept creep. I don't know if you've heard of this, which is there's a concept that has original meaning and then we expand its expand its meaning. So words like trauma, right? So trauma had a very you know specific meaning, and now people use it more loosely to refer to things it wasn't intended to um, refer to abuse. You know, these sorts. Of, um, so you can um, you can think of these terms like trauma, abuse prejudice, racism, and how they were expanding what they encompass. So I'm always concerned about just throwing around words like, oh, this is a religion or that's a religion, because that seems kind of like a variant of that, of that idea. It's just like we're expanding the definition of what religion means. And man, you, can't, you get 10 sociologists in a room and ask them what religion is, and you're going to get 11 answers, um, because it's just, you know, it's such a complex, um, it's such a complex um, construct. So... But what I would say is um, it has have properties that are religious-like. So that's why I say quasi-religion, right? It doesn't have a, a, an ancient sacred text or a explicitly supernatural um, or, you know, origin story or any, you know, it doesn't have any of that kind of stuff, right? Um, but it does, it does seem to be motivated by some of the same motives. Um, so people want to feel meaningful. They want to feel like they're part of something bigger than themselves. They want to feel like they matter. Um, it seems to also not just meaning, but it has a very more moral connection to it. And there's, like I said, there's research suggesting that moral concern is a driver of, is one of the drivers of religiosity. Um, so a lot of the social justice stuff, it's people saying they're, you know, they, they, they feel for people. They're worried about people, right? They care about people. And so it comes from some of those same, some of that same, I think, cognitive architecture as religion. And it also seems to have like a, um, you know, and I know this is what some other people point out. It, it has like some of these like similar sort of ideas that, um, you know, people have made. I think pe- haven't people made like the comparison to, to sin? Like there's a, except in this case, the sin is, I guess whiteness or something like that. Like you're, you know, you know. What's interesting though about like contrasting it with something like religion, um, which has a spotty track record, of course, in terms of um, people living up to um, living up to the Christian ideals of, you know, of, of um, love and compassion, and um, but at least in the Christian narrative, there's this notion that we're all sinners. We're all in the same boat. Again, this gets back to the common humanity. Like, you're not better than me. I'm not better than you. In this new intersectionality kind of movement, that doesn't seem to be the case. Like, some of us are more sinners than others, right? Some of us are, um, some of us have more privilege, and that is equivalent to being more, um, you know, more sinful, I guess, in some way, if you want to use that. Um, but it does, yeah, it does seem, and it, so I would, you know, I would, in fact, I would argue that. The decline, and I make this point in my book, not specifically about social justice activism, but just more broadly about when you see a decline in traditional religiosity in a society, it's not the case that people are becoming more, um, they're like abandoning religion for this more like completely rational, analytical approach to life. Um, 
so I think that that spiritual bandwidth or whatever you want to call it that was you know that kind of went um, that was granted to religious pursuits is now being directed into these other into these other ideolo- ideologies um, with, um, for the very very similar reasons and exploiting very the same underlying cognitive and um, narrow architecture. So in my w- when I started my education at, at Portland State, I was my I was really excited to be. Um, reli- going back into academe now, now as an atheist and looking forward to being in a very um, secular environment in Portland, Oregon, it was a big contrast to yeah. my um, how I lived my life as an undergrad. Um, but when I got there, uh, what I noticed was uh, even though the majority, overwhelming majority of my peers, um, were were secular, non 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 traditional religion, they. Their adherence, I would I'd use that word adherence, to um, their activism and beliefs, um, progressive, far-left beliefs, uh, it reminded me a lot of the fundamentalist community that mm-hmm. I, I left. There, there were, uh, I mean, of course, as you pointed out, may, many important differences, but also other ones that, um, ones that, that made me uncomfortable about the the evangelical community I was a part of, I'm, I see repeated just mm. uh, with the, like a different paint. Yeah, yeah. Um, in the secular um, social justice context, from a psychological perspective, what do you think are um, the consequences of campaigns telling whites to have um, shame and guilt? That's something I observe. Mm-hmm. Um, I tend to think of it. I, I try to put myself in the shoes of, let's say, what happened if I did happen to come from a white background and I see this. I think I would feel like my my initial reaction is I'm supposed to feel shame. Yeah. So it depends on the, the individual. Um, and so this is why this tactic is sometimes successful to, you know, more typically more left-leaning progressive people, uh, white people, um, do sort of take on this, this white guilt, I guess. Um, I guess that's what they're doing. Because um, they will submit or capitulate um, and be, um, I guess, allies is what sometimes people refer to themselves as. Um, but that tactic is really only going to work on certain people, right? And so there's a whole bunch of other people that are going to say, no, like, I'm not going to feel guilty for um, the sins of my father, uh, you know, or grandfather or ancestors. Um, and I'm not doing anything to, to 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 harm anyone, and so. But then what happens is you put people, and this gets back to the why this is such a bad tactic for the for the people that it's going to work. You're kind of preaching to the choir already, right? They're already um, they probably already to the extent. And I'm making the assumption here that a lot of these campaigns are are really more political, right? It's kind of leftist stuff, right? So these people already probably kind of support the same stuff. Um, so if you're trying to make a pitch to um, to more right-leaning or centrist or apolitical um, people, then it's not a very persuasive pitch to try to make them feel guilty for something that they don't um, feel guilty for. So the whole like toxic masculinity, I think, is a good. I know you were talking about um, a lot of race activism, but this whole there's a whole like feminist thing about toxic masculinity and it's amazing how certain forms of prejudice are just openly people are openly confident about right they can just you know there'll be a shooting uh, like a a mass shooting or something like that and people will just openly get on the internet and talk about how white men are horrible the worst of the worst right and um I guess this comes from this intersectionality or like privilege sort of perspective, right? That it's okay to be prejudiced against a, dom- a group that's perceived as dominant. Because of you know, the, the power dynamics. They have the power dynamics, right? right? But what's interesting about that is what these, I think what these people don't realize is that these, um, a lot, the same processes are at play, no matter, the same underlying components of prejudice are the same, right? Regardless of the group. And people have this weird thing about, oh, you can't have reverse racism. Well, there's no such thing. There's just racism. There's just sexism. There's just prejudice. In psychology, when these terms were defined, 
it never, there was never any of these but, right? But you can't be racist against this group or, you know, um, that's been like a, that's a recent kind of sociological or postmodern or some kind of effort to redefine a prejudice in terms of power, power differentials or per perceived power differentials. Um, so that, all that's really interesting, but that's definitely not historically the way psychologists you know, who have studied prejudice have, have treated these concepts at all. So it's always amazing to me as a, you know, as a classically trained empirical psychologist how certain types of prejudice are just, com it's completely okay, right? Like everyone's fine with, fine with certain types of prejudice. Um, it's not productive. You're not going to win a lot of... Um, male allies or white allies or whatever people are looking for um, by telling them there's something wrong with them based on their biological sex or their race or um, it just again it just seems weird that's all this when you're a kid you're told don't judge people by these characteristics right so it just seems like a really really odd um, phenomenon that in certain instances it's perfectly socially acceptable at least in progressive circles, um, to be um, to have certain forms of racism and sexism, and religious bigotry, right? Like it's it's completely fine to um, um, have bigotry towards Christians. So that's actually a good segue to what I was going to ask next. Um, over the years, and more recently, I've I've come to really have a um, strong respect for people who are motivated by their 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 faith to to do good uh, to others in and um, the world in the past I, I used to be more bitter and disparage religion a lot I, I in some of your writings um, you you've made a defense of um, of prayer well like whenever we have these mass attacks and tragedies in this country that are so common um, you see kind of like these two responses online people asking for thoughts and prayers and then a lot of really bitter and spiteful comments um, telling people to shove their prayers up their ass and do something <laughs> and yeah. uh, you've written about this mm -hmm. and I wanted to ask you more about it like why what's what are your views and thoughts on this area I'm the you know my parents were missionaries I was born in Africa I spent the first six years of my life in West Africa um, and so I, you know, I, I, I grew up in a, uh, a conservative religious um, family. Uh, I went to, you know, college and university and started studying psychological motives. And, and, and you know, as we talked about before, and, you know, I, I have no doubt that my upbringing had some influence in the types of research questions I was interested in. And, and that's how... I suspect I started, you know, I, I, ha I had an interest in psychology of religion in particular. Um, and I, you know, I, as someone who studies psychology of religion, I, you know, I'm a, I approach it from a completely, you know, empirical, um, quantitative, you know, scientific lens. But I do think there, you know, I do think that having had this background gave me some perspective at least tripped some of my, um, you know, some of my skepticism when I would see people mocking religion or saying, you know, everyone who's really, you know, you, you, you see, you know, a fair amount of this, I guess. Um, and where, you know, people say, oh, everyone who's religion, religious is stupid or, you know, irrational or, irrational or dogmatic or closed minded and, you know, a lot of that just didn't square with my personal experience. Of, uh, and, and so, of course, that's not a basis for, for anything, right? I, I'm not asking anyone to listen to my lived experience, right? But, it, but it, you know, it tripped my, you know, it tripped my skepticism about this kind of stuff, about these kind of accusations against religious people. Well, what, what, what do the hotline atheists get wrong about their, their views on people, in pray, on people who pray in prayer? So, uh, you know, there's actually a fair amount of research that prayer has a number of measurable psychological and social um, positive effects. And so, of course, when people do this research, they're not saying prayer works, 
Um, they're not making any supernatural claims, or they wouldn't be, you know, if we could, it, they, they, they wouldn't be scientific, right? But what they can measure is they can look at people who pray. They can actually, you can do studies where you have people pray in the laboratory, for instance, and then do other tasks. And what they find is, you know, contrary to this, you know, contrary to this idea that prayer is just a waste of time, as they find that, you know, prayer makes people feel more connected to others that might have some positive influence on, on self-control. In a lot of ways, prayer is a, um, though it is a spiritual, so it does have more of this kind of intuitive um, flavor, there are, you know, aspects of it that, you know, seem kind of rational in the sense that um, a lot of times people are praying, they're meditating on difficult issues, right? So it's interesting because you have a situation when you talk about the hard light and atheists making fun of prayer. You have a situation when they're making, when they're often making a claim that's not evidence-based. It's just based on their intuition about people who pray, right? Um, if you look at the evidence, um, it doesn't seem to be the case that people are praying and not doing something else. For instance, most people go to the doctor uh, and they say they pray in addition to um, getting medical interventions, with the exception of a few fundamentalists, you know, that, um, that use faith-based only, you know, kind of interventions. But that, those people are few and far between. Most religious people see it as a way to complement more traditional empirically-based um, approaches or solutions. So again, I would just emphasize that it, it's funny that, you know, it's easy for people to be like, oh, prayer is stupid or irrational or people who do it are wasting their time um, and they're not, you know, they're avoiding, they're hiding from real solutions. Um, I say, show me the data. <laughs> hey, show me the data that's true because I can, you know, as a piece I wrote that you mentioned for National Review, it seems to me there's, a, there's um, if anything, there's a lot of data that contradicts that, um, that assumption. Um, so I know you're working on a, a book that's uh, to be released this summer about the psychology of religion. And in it, um, from what I understand, you're actually comparing the psychology of the religious mind and the atheist mind, and you, you actually you make a provocative argument, do you not? Um, yeah, no, that's right. So my argument is basically that people focus on differences between theists and atheists, and so there's a lot of talk about how these groups are different or supposedly different. Um, and I make the claim that the differences are smaller than people realize. There are differences, notable differences, but the differences are a lot smaller than many people think. And in a lot of ways, the, there's more similarities than differences. A lot of differences don't really exist. So, for instance, we published a paper just this year on the on this idea of need for meaning, right? That people have a need to see their lives as meaningful. And we looked at it as kind of a person, what we call an individual difference variable. And what I mean by that is look at it as something that differs from person to person um, and is a stable characteristic of, of them. So some people would say that we all have a need for meaning, but like so many other things, um, some people are really, really oriented towards meaning a lot. And some people are less concerned with it. And so what we found in that research is need for meaning is, is, a, is a very reliable um, predictor of religiosity and belief in God. So people who score higher in a need for meaning measure um, are more likely to believe in God and more likely to report religious activities and, and practices. Um, and so that's evidence that there's some difference between theists and atheists and this, you know, how high they are in the need for meaning. Um, but in addition to that, if you, even though that difference is significant, if you actually look at the averages, the differences are pretty small. It's not like atheists don't need meaning and theists do. Um, you know, we're talking about like on a one through six scale, you know, we're talking about like the difference between like a three and a four average, right? Um, so, you know, atheists are just a little bit lower on this need for meaning. Um, and so if you look at other cognitive traits, which we have as well, such as intuition and rational thinking, because that's another argument that people make, is that um, religious people are irrational and atheists are rational. Well, the differences are pretty small, actually. Um, and so, and a lot of times, you know, we, a lot of times we do find some evidence that um, theists, you know, believers score higher on kind of intuition on measures of intuition, how much they, you know, um, trust their gut, you know, um, sort of thinking. 
Um, even though we find that often, um, we often don't find that there's differences in rational, th rational thinking. So these things are kind of separate, um, separate dimensions. Being high on intuition doesn't mean you're low on, um, on rationality. These are, you know, these are, you know, oftentimes what we call orthogonal or independent processes. Um, we can get more into that. You know, they do work. They often work antagonistically. Like when you're in an intuitive mindset, you're not thinking. Any, Rationally, when you're in a rational mindset, you're not trusting your intuition. Um, but what we found in a lot of this work is it's not the case that you know um, theists aren't you know th theists aren't like intuitive, emotional, um, irrational um, animals, and and atheist completely robot-like, analytical, you know, rational animals. Um, they're a lot more similar than people think, and a lot of times it's your rationality and intuition is situationally specific. So, for instance, there are people, you know, um, despite common belief, there's a fair amount of religious scientists, you know, scientists who are religious. Yes. Um, and many of them um, will, uh, you know, they'll go to church or in their, or have in their spiritual practices, in their spiritual life, they will, um, you know, embrace um, a more non-empirical approach, right? It's faith, right? They'll say, I'm acting on on faith, and and so that's a more intuitive um, perspective. But then they go to work on Monday morning, and they're scientists, and they can completely switch to a more empirically based, rational perspective. And that's how people are, really. They're they're complex. So atheists as well. Atheists might think they're rational all the time, but the truth is, a lot of the um, a lot of their interests and hobbies and pursuits and things that give them meaning and things that make them feel like um, you know life has has beauty and value, their social connections, what they love, these are all intuitive as well. Um, and so they might reject one particular type of supernatural belief, but they, um, all those cognitive and motivational properties that are associated with supernatural beliefs are still often you know, found in the atheist mind. We're not blank slates particularly in this yeah. regard in that um, your psychological wiring in your mind actually yeah. you can yeah. yeah I've seen you know kind of public intellectuals who are atheist activists um, kind of make a you know, make a blank slate argument I've heard people explicitly say that um, humans are born atheists right and then it's you know th th that they're taught religion Right? And so they make this blank slate argument right? that the religion is just software that's imposed on, on people, cultural learning, right? Um, but that's not, um, that's, not there, that's not true. So, for instance, there is a lot of evidence that spirituality, you know, the characteristics of spirituality, and, and including um, the, the belief in God, is, um, can be found very, very evidence of that you know, the underlying properties of that can be found very, very early in, in life. That actually our default mode is probably dualism, right? To see minds and bodies as separate. And um, people have a, a, have a natural pr propensity towards belief. And this differs between individuals. So it is true that specific religions are taught, right? You're not born um, with, um, with a Christian worldview or an Islamic worldview. Um, but the underlying ingredients that eventually get funneled into religion seem to be, um, uh, some of that seems to be innate. It seems to, you seem to be born with. Um, and so likewise, there's reasons to believe that some people don't really, religion is hard for them. They don't have a lot of those characteristics that um, incline people towards um, religiosity. Um, there's also some research that, quite a bit of research actually, that women are the more religious sex. Um, women score higher in you know, most measures of religiosity and, and are more likely to believe in God. Now there is some cross-cultural challenge to that because in, more Islamic, um, in the Islamic world, um, in Muslim-majority countries, um, they often don't find such a sex difference, or even maybe sometimes that males are more religious. Um, now, the, my challenge to that would be that it's hard to know 
because in cultures that are, you know, you find this with other sex difference research, in cultures that have more freedom, right, where people can do what they want and follow the, their natural instincts, right, you often see gender differences. It's in cultures where there's a lot of, you know, more structural control um, that you see fewer gender differences. And I think this might be the case with, um, with the religiosity as well. It's not a large gender difference, but there is a gender difference that seems to be mediated by this concept called, well, there's just, you know, some recent research out that suggests it's mediated by this concept called moral or empathetic concern. And so women seem to be more worried about the welfare of others and more, you know, more, more um, in terms of social cognition, seem to have more wiring for that, uh, have, or have more of that kind of inclination, I guess you should say, and that seems to mediate that, um, that gender difference, that moral concern is highly correlated with religiosity and belief in God. Well, now you just touched a bit on sex differences, and that yeah. is, is yeah. very controversial. I, I have a simple question. Was James Damore wrong? So I would say that he wasn't wrong. That Because um, I, I was hesitating for a second because there's two ways to interpret that question. You could say, was he wrong about the information he presented or was he wrong to do (laughs) what he did, right? And so I think in both cases, he wasn't totally wrong. Now on the information he presented, and I did read the memo, but it's been, you know, it's been a while. Um, I remember reading it and thinking, yeah, you know, you know, he might have, maybe the, maybe it wasn't the most sensitive presentation, but he did, and some of these issues are, some of the evidence he's talking about, there is counter, you know, it's, 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 some of it is, has been challenged, but I think he did a pretty, from what I remember, he did a pretty decent job of presenting. So there, you know, uh, for instance, we know that um, women score higher on the trade of neuroticism. Now, what ha- I think what happened is, in psychology world, saying neurotic or neuroticism doesn't isn't a bad word. It's one of the dimensions of the five-factor model of personality. Um, so when you say neuroticism in psychology, people are just like, oh yeah, individuals um, differ in neuroticism, which is basically trait worry, trait anxiety, moody. You know, so people who worry about things and who are anxious about things are high in neuroticism. People who are really chill and never worry about anything are low in neuroticism. So it's a stable personality trait that's largely heritable. So that's not controversial in psychology, uh, in empirical psychology at all. In personal, I mean, ask any personality psychologist, and that's, that idea is not controversial. And there's a, you know, there's a sex difference. Women score higher on, um, on neuroticism. And women are also more likely to have the psychopathologies or mental illnesses that are associated with that. Like, so they're more likely to have anxiety disorder and depression, for instance. But in you know popular culture, neurotic sound you know that has kind of like a bad you know has like a stigma right. You're calling someone neurotic, um, and so I think that what happened is he was actually trying to use the the you know the um, the language, the vernacular of of psychology of empirical psychology to people that aren't um, don't think that way, and so that was considered. Um, Offensive. I think if you, I think if you would have, if somebody like if a student wrote something like that for a class in psychology, um, the professor wouldn't freak out about it. Right? It wouldn't. That wouldn't seem like that controversial of a position. Um, so think about that. Right. That wouldn't be a controversial position in a personality class in a with a professor who is an expert in that particular area. Um, not to say that all, there's certainly ways that you could debate, you know, his, his his positions, but it wouldn't be considered totally out of, uh, uh, you know, out of order. With with these sensibilities that we see in popular culture, is it does it affect the ability of researchers to to do what they want to do, what they need to do? So people have made this point that uh, that people won't people will be worried to study controversial topics. And I think there has been some, I think in the UK, if I remember, like there was a university, there was a story a while back that there was a university was saying people aren't going to study issues related to transgenderism, right? Or something like uh, that. Detransitioning. Detransitioning, right. Yeah. 
So it is. So that is worrying, right? That people, um, and that's a, that's an institutional case. But I think just at the personal level, there would be a lot of people that it's like, yeah, it's not really worth, you know, it's not really worth bothering studying this. Now, in the case of sex differences, there are some important, you know, um, not just in psychology but in medicine, there are some really important questions that could actually make life better for for men and women, right? By by being able to interrogate these questions completely openly. So these aren't just intellectual curiosities. Of, hey, I just want to know, like, are men and women different in this regard? It can have real consequence. You know, it can have important consequences. And so, yeah, I do think there is some concern that people will avoid controversial topics, especially if they're pre-tenure, if, you know, if they're junior faculty. Um, in addition to that, I think that, which this is a separate issue, but I think a lot of people, um, there's there's uh, a fair amount of, you know, kind of liberal bias and in, in the social sciences and, and behavioral sciences. So I think that there might be um, there might be people that don't want to do this research or don't you know don't want to ask these questions or want to obscure um, these questions you know answers to these questions because it goes against their you know kind of a political ideology. We we seem to be reliving these controversies uh, over and over, kind of like in a cycle. I'm just thinking of like the reactions to to Charles Murray's. Um, book, which was public, Bell Curve was published a long time ago, but people are still really angry about it now. Yeah. And then, of course, there was a big public spat with um, Sam Harris and the Vox editor in chief, uh, Ezra Klein, with this opportunity of having an empirical quantitative psychologist in front mm-hmm. of me. I I have to ask, what what is the research on 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 psychometrics in in relation to to race, is it as we we hear from Vox and in those in the uh, the mainstream press that this is pseudoscience? Yeah, so I would say that it's not my area of expertise. I, so I don't have a strong opinion on it. I don't. I I I, I um, from what I do know, to suggest that it's pseudoscience seems um, kind of silly. Um, I, I kind of, and I think Sam Harris made this point, I kind of, you know, not kind of, I definitely lean towards the perspective that, that, that Sam Harris said, which is, I wouldn't want, you know, I don't, I don't think these are that interesting questions, I don't think the question is that interesting um, of looking for race differences in IQ. Um, that doesn't mean they don't exist or that any research that um, reveals them as pseudoscientific or, or anything like that. It's just, I don't find it... Um, a particularly uh, interesting area of, of inquiry. Do you think it's an ethical area of inquiry? Um, I wouldn't say it's. I wouldn't say it's unethical. Um, I guess. You know, one of the problems with, with you know, with going down that road, I think, is it's easy. Anything you know. So, for instance, you could imagine. Let's take a different a different controversial topic like abortion, right? You can imagine saying somebody saying, I don't want to do research that looks at potential mental health consequences of abortion to, you know, to a woman who's had an abortion because I, um, because, you know, I'm a progressive pro-choice, you know, person. So I don't want to, I don't even want to ask these questions or look at, you know, look at these because I'm afraid that um, they'll be used. But what if something comes out, right, that's bad, that looks bad, that looks like that it harms women's mental health? Um, in some way, right? And then what? And then and then the conservatives will use that. As, so you hear this kind of argument a lot. Like you shouldn't ask certain questions, or certain questions are kind of unethical because they could be politicized or weaponized in some ways. And that's just no way to. I mean, that's just no way to do science. That that takes you down. Um, you know, it takes you in a bad direction really quick. I gave the abortion example because it's controversial. But also, I think that this is, you know, I remember years ago being at a conference and, and overhearing uh, a woman talking about how, you know, she was doing research on, um, you know, kind of like longitudinal research on um, related to mental health and sort of different factors that contribute to, um, that may predict, you know, certain mental health outcomes. And I remember her saying, or just kind of overhearing her saying how she didn't, she wasn't collecting data on whether 
women that had abortions or not, had an abortion or not, right? And so there might be a lot of reasons where you wouldn't ask that, right? That haven't because you just don't think it's that interesting, and you you know you have limited resources and only so many questions you can ask and stuff like that. But what she said, which struck me as interesting, was that she said she was afraid of what she'd find. <laughs> and I thought, wow, that's you know that's um, I'd never heard someone say that before. That was this was a long time ago. Um, this um, and I just remember thinking to myself, oh wow, like that's. So it's not because you don't think it's an important question or it's not the area of your interest. So I just thought, oh, wow, what if people did that about everything? That would, um, any, you know, you imagine being like, well, I don't want to look at whether or not somebody comes from a divorced family. Or, um, <laughs> or you, you, you could, the, the list is limitless of the things that for political or moral reasons that you don't want to know the outcome. And so I just think it's really dangerous to go down, you know, to go down that path. Um, obviously, there are things that are unethical, but it's usually not like because what you'll find. It's usually because what you do, right? It's the, what you do to a, a um, how you manipulate or something. You know, how the the negative effect you could have on 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 people and, and their rights, right? Many universities um, are weaponizing and politicizing uh, mental health services, mm-hmm. and um, so there is this weird cultural shift. Um, um, it seems like on college campuses, um, where victimhood status carries some, you know, um, some kind of benefits, right? Some kind of benefits. And yeah, I do think it's being encouraged. You know, that piece I wrote for the Wall Street Journal on the weaponization of counseling services, mental health services on college campuses, you know, gets to this fear versus freedom idea because you have a, a speaker coming to campus like Ben Shapiro or Christina Off Summers or whoever, and happens to be saying something that is either mainstream conservative thought or just a challenge to, you know, the more like far left orthodox and you get, you know, counseling, you know, you get diversity offices and counseling service offices sending emails to students that there'll be service counseling services available um, in relation to this particular campus event, which is always voluntary, right? Like no one has to go to these talks to begin with. Um, so this is just political theatrics, but it hurts the campus because, well, one, it, it promotes this idea that you should, it's telling students they should feel threatened by this event. And again, that inspires a culture of fear, not a culture of freedom. Um, and it also can, I think it can contribute to the stigma of mental illness. So one of the things that a lot of mental health advocates talk about is de- you know, destigmatizing mental illness, that people shouldn't feel ashamed or embarrassed because one of the main problems, if you take, a, you, you take the most drastic um, phenomenon re- related to mental illness, suicide, right, because it, uh, it results in death, um, a decent percentage of the people who commit suicide never sought help, right? Um, and so you have these issues where, on the one hand, a lot of people are rightly worried about stigma because there's people in need who aren't going and getting help. But on the other hand, you have these campus activists, diversity officer, you know, counseling service people that are you know, possibly contributing to the stigma of mental illness by acting like every little thing should trigger people. And then people are just gonna be like, oh, these are just a bunch of, bit, you know, these are a bunch of snowflakes. And, you know, and so that's, I think, that, I think we should be concerned about that as well. After I wrote that article, I actually received a number of letters from parents thanking me, and also mental health professionals thanking me um, saying that they just can't believe that this is happening. That you know, this is mental mental illness is a real is a real issue, and um, they can't believe people are politicizing it. There's no, um, you know, this isn't a left versus right issue. Um, whether you have something like major depression, bipolar disease, schizophrenia, um, you struggle with alcohol ad- addiction, or anything like th- these are not uh, these are not partisan issues, right? These are human. Um, these are you know these are human pains. Um, and so, um, so that, I mean, there's a lot of th- crazy stuff that happens on campus that drives me nuts, but that one really, really struck me as uh, people who are doing that, I think that's not only, I mean, it's malpractice in a way, I think, or it's, it's, it's at least professionally irresponsible to, to abuse psychology, mental health, um, um, 
mental health in that way, I think. Well, I can see why a lot of people wrote letters to you thanking you. You know, um, I'm really honored to have this opportunity to speak with you face to face and get to thank you uh, in person for um, speaking out um, with with clarity on these issues that are, um, are hot button issues and can have pro- professional and even academic consequences potentially. If people want to get connected into to learn more about you and what you do, where should they go? So I'm on Twitter reluctantly, (laughs) I guess. I do like it, um, but sometimes I wonder about it. What's your Twitter handle? Um, Oh, man. (laughs) You got to have that one down. uh Uh-oh. It might just be Clay Rutledge. (laughs) I don't know. Um, Oh, boy. Um, But um, my website's clayrutledge.com. And indeed, his Twitter handle is at Clay Rutledge. Professor Rutledge's new book, Supernatural, is now available for purchase. If you enjoyed this interview, please consider becoming my supporter through Patreon or by giving a one-time gift on PayPal. I'm just getting started, so your support really helps. You can find the links in the description.